Uh, tonight we have Dr. Taruna Crawford, and she's going to be talking to us all about hand and wrist pain. A little bit about our Riverside Orthopedic Specialist. Uh, just last year, last fall, we brought together five uh, orthopedic specialists to Riverside and to this community here in Kinky County and the surrounding counties that we serve at Riverside. And we currently offer expertise in hand, shoulder, hip, and knee, as well as sports medicine. In addition to that, Dr. Crawford and other uh, orthopedic surgeons that we brought on uh, went through some extensive training with our nurse practitioners at our seven immediate cares that we uh, service at Riverside, which means we have much more people now who can assess and meet the needs of those who come in with orthopedic injuries with a direct link to our orthopedic surgeons located at our Bourbon A campus. At Riverside, we're committed to keep care local. We're committed to provide the most expertise, and that's absolutely what we have here with Dr. Crawford here tonight. As an essential part of our heart health system, Dr. Crawford comes to Riverside with several years of experience in her field. She received a Doctor of Medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. She then completed her residency at the University of Cincinnati and went to get on to her fellowship at the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons through the Washington Health Policy Fellows in Rosemont and a fellowship in hand surgery in Philadelphia. Dr. Crawford is board certified in orthopedic surgery and holds a subspecialty certificate in hand surgery from the American Board of Orthopedic Surgeons. And she is also certified an independent, as an independent medical examiner by the American Independent Medical Examiners. So, very qualified, very certified, and has been a great addition to this community and you should all enjoy the talk tonight. So without further ado, Dr. Taruna Crawford. Thank you, first of all, for coming out. I know it's evening and it's um, kind of around dinner time-ish and stuff, and maybe some stomachs are growling, but I appreciate you guys coming out and listening to my talk. Um, but So basically, we're going to do a little bit of an overview about hand and wrist pain um, and talk about generically kind of like what do you expect when you go see a hand surgeon, um, what are some common conditions that maybe some of you guys have or maybe somebody you know has, and um, kind of what to expect when you go to the office. Um, and Kyle kind of already went over my background to a fair amount, but I grew up in the southwest suburbs here in Palos Hills, um, went to Northwestern, went to Cincinnati, went to Philadelphia, and then was practicing for, a while, for about eight years in the western suburbs before I moved down here. Um, so specifically, what is a hand surgeon? A lot of people have never even heard of a hand surgeon before. Um, but basically, a hand surgeon is uh, a subspecialist in either orthopedics or plastic surgery, and it's somebody who specializes in both surgical and non-surgical management of hand and wrist uh, conditions, and depending upon the individual, we usually tend to go all the way up the upper extremity. Um, it's kind of an interesting field. It's a specialty that actually developed out of military strategies, like many of our surgical fields that uh, made some advances. Um, and it developed out of World War II when we started having improvements in mortality rates with our, um, based on our general surgeon colleagues and when they were able to triage patients better and be able to save their lives so that they could actually make it out to um, usually a station in Europe and then from Europe they would come to the U.S. When we improved some of these mortality rates, now people were able to live and they came back and then they would have other injuries of the upper extremities, of the lower extremities, and so specialties kind of de developed out of this as far as how to treat these additional injuries people are having. Prior to that, our mortality rates were higher in wars, and so sometimes some of these injuries didn't come there. And so it's a relatively newish specialty in the sense that it's been around since about the 50s and 60s um, as far as a subspecialty is concerned. Um, and a hand surgeon basically treats anything that's in the extremity, in the upper extremity. So that could be bones, it could be nerves, arteries, tendons, ligaments, fractures, amputated fingers, amputated arms, sports injuries, kids, adults, um, kind of the whole gamut of treatment. It's just that it's more kind of anatomically localized to the upper extremity area. Um, so we're going to kind of go over some anatomy lessons, uh, because this is surgery after all. And then we're going to um, talk about some common causes of hand and wrist pain. We'll talk about the office visit itself, um, what to expect, some of the tests that are commonly ordered for hand conditions, and then treatment options for some of the most common things that you've probably heard of, arthritis, carpal tunnel, tendonitis. 
So, um, so let's first go to the anatomy. And so, you know, sometimes people get a little bit worried when it comes to bony things. I'm not going to have graphic pictures in my talk. So no worries about that. Nothing scary coming up. So it's going to be some really cool things that are hand related, okay? So when we're talking about things in the hand, there's all sorts of conditions. There's arthritis that has bones and joints involved. Tendonitis has tendons involved. The carpal tunnel has nerves that are involved. And once you start getting into ligaments, there's so many ligaments that, as I said in Philly, forget about it. <laughs> so guess how many bones in your finger? A lot. Very close. So there's three bones in each finger, except your thumb. It's a little bit shorter, so you got two bones in that. And so when you start talking about your entire hand and wrist, that's where you get a lot of bones. So we've got 29 bones just in your hand and wrist. So when you break something, it could be one of 29 bones. So, um, and this is kind of like a cartoon drawing of all the different bones that we have in our hand and in the fingers. And even our wrist is made up of a lot of bones right there, a lot of little bones and then two bigger bones in the wrist that are commonly injured when you fracture a wrist. And this is kind of like what an x-ray looks like. So it's basically, you're able to see the bony stuff on an x-ray. You can't see ligaments and tendons and nerves and arteries on x-ray. You see the bony stuff, which is where the calcium is. And so when you're talking about arthritis, you're talking about things related to bones. You're talking about where one bone meets another bone, okay? so. Arthritis can happen in older individuals. Um, it can happen with osteoarthritis. A lot of times people think of that as like wear and tear arthritis, but it may not necessarily be so. And we're kind of researching that and understanding and learning more about that. Um, we know that there's a genetic component to it. Arthritis can also develop in kids and there's inflammatory arthritis that can happen. And then there's other kinds of arthritis too. It can develop after an injury or a trauma. It can develop after an infection. And so basically there's different forms of these arthritis that we can have. And so the question kind of is, is well, what is arthritis then? And arthritis is basically a wearing away of the lining around the joint, okay? So, so when you look in a joint, right, a joint is basically where two bones meet each other, okay? So you've got one bone meeting another bone. And in between the two, there's a space. And in that space is something called your cartilage. And the cartilage is basically kind of like a shock absorber. Okay, so think of cartilage as kind of like, you know, if you're talking mechanics, it's kind of like the brake pad, the rubber part of the brake pad. Okay, or it's like some kind of like a rubber stopper. Then you also have a lining that goes around your joint. It's called your synovium. Okay, and what happens is when these surfaces get worn out and damaged, and the joint is, the two bones aren't gliding smoothly on, that, on top of each other, that's what starts to cause pain. And then what happens is, is when you start to have pain because it's not gliding smoothly, then your body starts to do things to try to make it glide more smoothly. Like it makes more lubrication, which you see as swelling in a joint or fluid on the joint. It tries to shut down that that abnormal gliding and so you develop bone spurs which kind of limit the ability to bend that joint okay and so you eventually get this unevenness and this unevenness can eventually develop into kind of like a bone on bone appearance okay and so if you've probably seen a joint before if you've ever been like you know preparing meat or something like that and you cut into a chicken right and you feel like that kind of greasy stuff that comes out if you're cutting into a joint of a chicken bone. Um, and then you'll see like a white cap of the cartilage on the end of the bone. That is the cartilage. And so that's the same stuff we have in our body and all of our joints. And that fluid is the, that, that kind of slick, slimy stuff is the same thing that we have in all of our joints. If you've ever had fluid taken off of a knee or something like that, that's basically what we're taking off is an excessive amount of that fluid. And so cartilage actually starts to wear away and it starts to develop like a wear. So you can kind of see on the, on the right hand side, on the right hand side um, that it's really nice and smooth and it's clean and white. And then on the left hand side, you can see where there's like kind of these gaps in the cartilage and it's rough looking and kind of shaved and stuff. 
And so this is kind of what a normal x-ray looks like. You have these nice spaces in between the bones, and that space is where that cartilage is living. And then when it starts to wear out, that's when you get the bone-on-bone -bone stuff, is when it starts to look arthritic. Okay? And so that's kind of like the radiographic portion of what that cartoon picture was of the bone on the bone. That's kind of what we see when we look at it on the x-ray. So um, as I was stating before, osteoarthritis is a very um, common form of arthritis that can happen. It can happen sometimes at a younger age. People can start developing it in their 20s and 30s. Sometimes it doesn't develop until you're older. Sometimes people never develop osteoarthritis. Their, you know, their fingers and their hands look just as smooth as you know, it did when they were younger. Um, we know that there is a genetic component to it, and that's one of the things that we're researching um, to kind of look at. And osteoarthritis is very different than rheumatoid arthritis, if you look at this, because rheumatoid arthritis is an inflammatory arthritis, and so you get a lot of this kind of joint deformities and um, really swollen knuckles and things like that. So there are two different kinds of arthritis. And then there's post-traumatic arthritis, like we talked about, where if you look at the very end bone of the, you know, you can see where the, the bone is starting to wear away, and that's because somebody broke their bone over there, and then as it healed, it didn't heal properly. So one of the most common types of arthritis that you can see, it's called basal or thumb arthritis. It's basically this arthritis kind of at the base of your thumb joint. And so your thumb is actually made of three joints. There's this top joint right here. This is a joint right here, right where it meets the hand. And then this is actually part of your thumb way back here. Okay, and so this is called your basal or thumb joint. It's a very common reason people can have arthritis. And it's uh, one in three women actually end up developing basal or thumb arthritis. One in eight, every eight men develop it. I think like half the women in this room are nodding because they're like, yes. yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it is very common. Um, and so, you know, you can kind of see how that knuckle gets thickened over there. I know. It's <laughs> yes, I took pictures of all of you guys as you were walking. In. So, yes. So, um, and there's other conditions you can sometimes get with basal or thumb joint arthritis. You can get carpal tunnel. You can get inflammation of the tendons, which is called tendonitis. You can get joint instability. Um, Sometimes people develop cysts around an arthritic joint, and sometimes that cyst pushes on like where the nail root is, and then the nail as it grows, it gets a ridge in it, or it can have like an uneven nail surface. So, and this is kind of a picture of an example of when people have like nodes on, you know, from their arthritic finger, and you can see with the cyst where that cyst has been pushing on the nail root, and then it makes the nail grow, you know, kind of different, like with a ridge and a bump in it. So we'll change gears and we'll talk now about some tendons. Any questions for small on arthritis? Yes? Can the to be regrown? Yes and no. That's a very tricky question. When it comes to when it's a generalized wear and tear, as you're starting to see with osteoarthritis, um, usually for individuals after the age of 40, it usually can't be grown. If it's just like a tiny area, there's a couple of spots that like I would say in the last um, like 25 years or so that we've been looking at um, cartilage and actually growing it in the laboratory and we're successful in doing this. It's usually for sports injuries where there's like maybe just like a penny size or a dime size area that's worn out on the knee that we can take some cartilage from the person or sometimes we get it from um, we get it from like a synthetic uh, from a donor and then we grow that cartilage and then we actually put a little patch on that spot and inject these cartilage cells in there and let let it kind of grow in but even those cells when they grow in it's kind of like it's kind of like um you know if you've got like a really nice lawn and then it's like you've got like a area that got kind of worn out and you patch it and like the grass looks a little bit different it kind of looks like that. It's like, it's the cartilage, it's something called fiber cartilage. It's not as good as the original thing you were born with, but it's something that can hopefully get somebody through, like when they're in their 20s and 30s after a sports injury that damaged one particular part of their joint. <coughs> so, but that is like the big research question that gets a lot of funding from the National Institute of Health, because right now when cartilage wears out, 
what do we do? We do replacements. We do replacements with plastic and metal parts or replacing it with, um, you know, other kinds of surgeries, silicone or, you know, various kind of things depending upon the joint. So anatomy for tendonitis. Guess how many tendons are in one finger? Three. So you get one for bending each of your knuckle down and one for straightening it out. But in your thumb you only get two because it's, remember, it's a shorter bone. And guess how many tendons are in your hand and your wrist? Over under, price is right. <laughs> Forty. So, so you've got a lot of things then to keep track of in that area as far as things that can get potentially injured. So one of my patients has previously said, is that right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's right. So um, if you mean a doctor just for hands, it's got to be complicated, it is, and which is why we specialize in this stuff. So, um, so here's a picture of just the tendons on the back of the hand, um, which can cause various kinds of inflammation, tendonitis. And what tendonitis basically means, it's literally it's inflammation of the tendon. Um, and some of the more common ones is you can get tendonitis um, along the side of your wrist heading up into your thumb is called the queer veins and basically on the back of the hand all of our tendons travel through a tight space in a tunnel and when the tendon gets very swollen um, and we have a tight space there's not enough room and it pinches the tendon and it causes irritation and causes pain so this is some, something that can, that's a very common form of tendonitis when I'm picking out like what are the most common ones. Um, it happens frequently with people who do a lot of repetitive kind of uh, work. So carpenters, office workers, musicians. Um, it also happens frequently in new mothers because they're always favoring kind of one side as opposed to the other side that they like to hold the baby's head on and so they're always crooking their wrist one way or another. And it, it's basically it causes pain with um, activity. And so a lot of things with tendonitis, because remember when we were looking at the x-rays, we talked about the x-rays show you bones, they don't show you tendons, right? So a lot of things with tendonitis is based on the history, like what are you telling, uh, what are you telling me when you come into the office, where does it hurt, where are you pointing, and then physical exam, which is me actually examining that tendon and figuring out um, where your pain is. And another very common tendonitis or form of tendonitis is called trigger finger. It's, um, some of you have probably known somebody or another who's had it. And it's a similar concept. It's basically just on the palm side of the hand where you have a swelling in the tendon. Again, you have a tight space because it's going through a pulley or a tunnel. And when it goes through there, it tends to cause pain. And actually the finger will even like lock up where you literally have to take your hand and flip it open. Yep, trigger finger. So. So, um, and then uh, another uh, common thing that we see as hand surgeons is nerve injuries or nerve, pinched nerves or irritation along nerves. And so one of the most common things you guys have probably heard of is carpal tunnel syndrome. And there's a couple of other different syndromes too that are up in the arm because you can see from this picture, all these different colors along these arms are different nerves. So carpal tunnel syndrome is one of the, like one of those options as far as like a nerve that can get pinched. Um, but there's also other nerves that are going in um, through other tunnels that can also get pinched. Um, and sometimes you can also get um, injuries as far as skin nerves and skin branches and um, nerves that are in your fingertip, you know, I, um, from just cutting it, whether it's like something bigger, like with a table saw or even like small injuries, like you're trying to slice open an avocado or something, kind of jab your finger or your hand and cut a nerve. Um, so carpal tunnel is one of the more common nerve things that hand surgeons see and a carpal tunnel is like there literally is a tunnel in the wrist that the nerve actually passes through and the floor of that tunnel is formed by these white bones you can see and then the roof of the tunnel is formed by that ligament. So you can kind of see here's the floor and here's the ligament and here's the tunnel. And in that tunnel is the nerve that goes up into these three fingers, okay? And then you have all of your tendons that bend your fingers go in that tunnel too. And so sometimes either one of two things happens, either you get a lot of swelling in the tunnel or what can happen is, is that, that ligament can actually thicken up and tighten up 
and slowly over time put pressure and decrease the surface area within the tunnel and cause carpal tunnel symptoms and cause inflammation and pain um, as it's pinching on that nerve. So when you come to the office, um, uh, there's a lot of different reasons people come to see uh, for an office visit. Um, and one of, the, one of the most common ways that we can diagnose you and the most important part of the entire visit is basically the history. Because I would say, based off of what you're telling me and kind of pinpointing where the pain is, even though there's all these different structures going on, um, the most important component of figuring it out is your description of where it hurts. And probably, I would say 90% of the time when you're walking out, even if it's not an x-ray, an MRI, or a diagnostic study, I've already got your diagnosis in my head and I know what we're doing, okay? So I ask you, how long has the pain been there? What's causing it? Are there particular things that bother it? Is gripping bothering it? Is it hard to open doors? Have you broken anything? Have you had any injuries? Do you have any family history of having inflammation? Um, and then I examine somebody, and so my examination is focused and specific to the condition um, that, based off of the history that I obtain, um, and I look and see, you know, are the joints swollen? Do they look kind of knobby? Or is, is something kind of looking thicker? Is, it, is there a bump over there? Is the color change in the skin? Like, does your muscle look kind of flatter? <laughs> You know, like, so for example, this is a, somebody with a carpal tunnel. So when you look at the fleshy part of the palm, you know, does it look kind of flat in there? You know, that's carpal tunnel and it's called atrophy of the muscle when we see that kind of stuff. Um, you know, as um, we look at the joints, how are the joints moving? Are they, you know, do they move naturally well on their own? Is it something that I can move better? Is it, does it feel unstable? What's your hand strength? I check people's grip strength and I do a little gripper and um, check the actual strength and then also ask about any other associated conditions or check out other things that and examine that would be relevant. And then we get x-rays in our office um, and we have x-ray in our office suite itself so you don't have to go somewhere else. Um, our x-ray tech takes a picture and we look at and see is there any arthritis or bony conditions that are contributing to your problem. Um, X-ray does have a little bit of minor radiation exposure as you're aware if you've, you know, going to the dentist and getting your teeth X-rayed and stuff. Um, so we put lead on you to protect you from the radiation. And then sometimes depending upon the condition, sometimes we'll get either a CAT scan or an MRI. Um, pretty small subset of people will need these <coughs> and usually the MRI happens if um, you know if there's something that's like a torn tendon or like a torn ligament or something that you know it's something that's injured that I think needs to have surgery that maybe is a fresh injury um, in some cases we'll get CAT scans even less frequently usually CAT scans are to kind of help plan for surgery for a really bad broken bone then we'll get a CAT scan um, we'll get a nerve test um, if you're having numbness and tingling, if the muscle looks kind of weak, um, if the joint's not moving properly, say you dislocated it or there's some concern with uh, how you're moving your fingers, sometimes we'll do a diagnostic injection. So that means, you know, I think that this is where most of your pain is coming from and sometimes, sometimes you have multiple, well most of the time as um, you can have multiple things that are causing the pain, but maybe it might really be just the one thing that's kind of bothering it the most. And if we take care of that one thing, then we can um, kind of specify the source of the majority of your pain and we narrow it down. And then sometimes we do other tests that are associated, like maybe we might get lab tests if I'm concerned that there might be inflammation going on or an infection or something like that. So, We'll talk about some non-operative um, treatment options and then we'll kind of go into some operative things. So a lot of times for arthritis, there's a lot of non-operative things you can do. Um, so uh, one of the most common things like I talked about, thumb arthritis that people come in to see a hand surgeon for. Um, some of the things you can do that are non-operative is you can modify your activity. So one of the things that bothers people with thumb arthritis is when you're pinching on things real hard and so you want to kind of widen your grip 
So that means getting tools that have like more of a rubberized handle, like a little bit of a wider rubberized handle. So um, I am not paid by them, but OXO brand is a very good brand. They sell them at Target and Bed Bath & Beyond. And they have jar openers. I just told a patient about that earlier today, actually. Um, you want to use things with a wider grip, so don't use like a skinny pen, like one of those skinny little big pens. Use like the ones with the big, thick, fat thing on it, you know, or you can actually buy like a little, like if it's a tool that doesn't come that way, you can make it thicker. Like you can buy electrical tape and like wrap it around a tool, or you can um, uh, basically take like a pipe insulation foam kind of and uh, and like cut it off and like slide it onto a tool to give it a rubber handle or like a bigger handle and make it more comfortable to use. You can um, take an anti-inflammatory if, uh, if it's something that you're allowed to take. So some people might have problems with your kidneys or your blood pressure or you're on a blood thinner. Um, and so those are reasons not to take it. So sometimes so you know you shouldn't just take an anti-inflammatory. You should check with your primary, and make sure if you if you've got a number of medical conditions or you're on other medicines because it can interact. Even something like simple and over the counter like ibuprofen, um, or you can take like something like Tylenol or generic for Tylenol, acetaminophen. Um, it's not an anti-inflammatory. It's more of a pain reliever. Um, but you know more people can take that unless you have liver problems. Okay, and then um, some of you guys have heard of glucosamine chondroitin and basically the research on that is still a little bit out um, it's kind of when we look at our Academy recommendations um, it's equivocal which means that maybe it works maybe it doesn't that's what it comes down to it does have to build up in your bloodstream if you um, are taking that and so it's usually something you won't notice for about two to three months uh, it does not regrow the cartilage as we talked about it's not a stem cell or anything like that but sometimes it does change like the inflammatory components of the fluid in the joint and so it can make the joint feel better and have less pain. The biggest drawback for that is its insurance doesn't cover it, you know it's out of pocket so I always tell my patients just go buy like a big bottle of it, the brand doesn't matter, just follow the directions and then give it a go for a couple months see if it makes a difference. Um, you have to watch out because some of the pills if you have a shrimp allergy you can't take them so um, you want to check and make sure that there's nothing with that. Um, and even though it sounds like glucosamine, it's not glucose, so it's um, even if you have diabetes, you can take it. There are steroid injections. So steroid injections basically decrease pain and swelling. Um, the benefit of a steroid injection, although it's not as pleasant, obviously, as taking a pill steroid, um, the nice thing is, is it doesn't have as much of the risk factors associated with taking a big dose of medicine that goes and works on your whole system. It's more targeted for the area that's, um, that's kind of like the irritating area. Um, it's not a good long-term solution though because especially in the hand, all these things are right all around each other like we talked about and so if you keep getting repeated injections, a little bit of that injection does leak into the surrounding tissue and we kind of saw how all those like tendons and bones and joints and everything was like all stacked right on top of each other and so if you keep doing repeated injections, it can cause laxity in the tissue or have other side effects that ultimately if you end up needing to have a surgery to address that condition, you can have um, kind of like the outcomes are not as good surgically if you've had like a whole bunch of injections in that area. Um, and then there's other risks um, that we're also mindful of and we keep, you know, we keep an eye and do it safely as far as doing it sterilely. We want to make sure you don't get an infection from the needle poke so we clean off your skin. Um, sometimes it can leave a little white spot or make, leave like a little dimple in the fat and those are more cosmetic. It depends on the joint um, and the size of the joint. So a big joint like your knee, which is like this big, you can probably get it more frequently. A little joint like this joint, like I tell people one or two times max, because again, it's all, it depends upon what's surrounding the area. So your knee joint is huge and the tissues around that area um, are pretty much avoided when you do an injection. So, but in general, it's not a, it's not a good long-term and permanent fix for something. The only time we do it like kind of just repeatedly and it's like that's the end game, that's the end plan that we have 
is if somebody is kind of in a position where surgery itself is so risky that, you know, right. even if we're doing an injection like, you know, three, four times a year, it's like there really is no other option because they can't have any kind of surgery for it because maybe they've got a really bad heart condition or a really bad lung condition or something and they can't withstand surgery. This is just an example talking about several years ago we had some um, issues with steroid injections um, where they were causing um, breakouts of meningitis and so I just put this slide in here more to kind of emphasize that you know sometimes we think steroid injections have no risk associated with them but there are risks with any procedure that you do and a steroid injection is a procedure we try to minimize those risks um, but certainly that's one of the things that when you start talking about long-term solutions of can you just get an injection every every couple months and kind of go along like that. Well, every time you do it, you're putting yourself at risk for certain things. There are splints that we can use. Um, so this splint that's um, over here is a common one we use for thumb arthritis. And um, there's that's like kind of a bigger, bulkier splint. There's a small splint that we use during the daytime. And then that's an example of a finger splint. Um, we have a therapist who's in our office. She's a certified hand therapist, and she actually custom fabricates uh, splints to people's hands. Um, there's a picture of a yeah. <laughs> uh, there's a picture here of a very commonly used uh, splint that we use for decor veins or for thumb arthritis or common reasons. Which, that's the black Velcro one, and then the one on the right is a trigger finger splint. <coughs> And hand therapy is a specialized kind of therapy. So there's um, physical therapy, there's occupational therapy, and then just like how in orthopedic surgery or plastic surgery, you can go and get subspecialization and become a hand surgeon, even within physical therapy and occupational therapy, they subspecialize after, um, gosh, it's like something like a thousand clinical hours or so. It's like essentially you have to be practicing as a therapist for minimally three years before you sit for your test, doing almost exclusively hands. So, um, so there is a, and they actually have like uh, programs too, like certificate programs that they do specifically for hand therapy. Um, that's different than what you think, um, what most people are kind of more familiar and aware with is physical therapy where you're going and you're kind of like on the little on the exercise bicycle or you know doing kind of like stretches and those kind of things and so hand therapy you're kind of sitting down at a table and you're working with a therapist and they're doing either massage or working on a joint or having you do things functionally to improve your hand so um, so surgical options so kind of like I was talking about arthritis it's kind of like when you've got an uneven wear pattern somewhere in the cartilage and you can kind of think about it like, you know, when you have like a worn out, you know, like a pothole in the road and you kind of think to yourself, well, if you've got a pothole in the road, can't you just kind of go in there and patch it up and that should make sense. And, and unfortunately, like we we're talking about with the stem cells, it's a very small subset of injuries that you can actually do that with. Usually when people have arthritis, you're doing things that um, are either arthroscopic, like you're cleaning it out, or you're doing a joint replacement made out of metal or silicone, or with thumb arthritis, there's like kind of a tendon transfer that we do. It preserves our motion um, and it preserves our joint function. Um, and so depending upon what the goal is, how old the patient is, like are they planning on working hard labor, for example, still with their hand, um, then we might do a different kind of surgery where we actually stiffen up that joint permanently, which allows them to, you know, really kind of go to town and use their hand just as hard and heavy as they were doing before. Arthroscopy is done um, with tiny poke holes, and um, so we have arthroscopy, it could be, there's limited applications in the thumb joint. Most commonly, um, we can do it in the wrist, we can do it in the elbow or shoulder, um, hip, knee arthroscopy. So um, these are surgeries I do over at the Riverside Hospital. Um, arthritis joint replacements, like we are talking about, it preserves joint replacement preserves motion. And so um, there's certain categories of, you know, whether or not you're a candidate for an, a joint replacement surgery. Um, but basically, the primary benefit of it is as a pain reliever. Um, the drawback is, is sometimes that joint replacement can wear out, and so that's why we want to make sure, you know, if it's somebody who's doing hard, heavy labor, and say they're in their 30s or 40s, that's not a good person um, to get a joint replacement. 
Um, and, you know, joint replacements are basically pain relieving surgery. So they're not as good as like, you know, when you were in your 20s and the kind of joint you were born with, but it's something that preserves some of the motion and there is still a little bit of a difference that you feel, but most patients are very happy after getting a joint replacement as far as the pain relief is concerned. And so there's, believe it or not, finger joint replacements that I do. Um, there's metal replacements and there are silicone replacements that we do and they're really, you know, they're tiny. That picture is probably, um, I don't know, 10 times the size of, of what it actually is. It's, it's quite small to fit into your little knuckle and it fits into like those two little stems kind of fit into the marrow part of the bone. So it kind of looks like that when you look at where it sits inside there. You can do a joint fusion. A joint fusion is when you stiffen up two bones together. And if you think about it, sometimes, um, depending upon how bad your bone and your joint is, sometimes it's already stiff and you don't even have barely any motion. You barely have any motion to it. And so the pain actually comes from even just that micro motion of the two bones rubbing on each other, those raw bones. And so it's a good option for um, most joints. And you know what I ask patients, usually it's the, the tip of the finger, the end of the finger joint. And when you know, people are like, oh, so I can never move it. And I, and I say, well, let's see you move it now. And they'll go, I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, there's not too much we're losing. So, so that's an option. Um, so here's an example of a patient who had a joint fusion. He had a bad, um, kind of like a really bad arthritic injury with like kind of like a, like a big open wound from an industrial accident and um, had pain. And so afterwards he had a little screw put across, fusing the two bones together and then his pain was better. And that was a good option for him because one, it's at the end of the finger and two, um, you know, this, this particular patient was in his late 30s and he wanted to go back and do hard stuff. So trigger finger is also a very common um, condition we take care of and the surgery for that is like we talked about, um, tendons are passing through little tunnels and what we call pulleys and so when it's too tight to get through there we literally just open up that little pulley, we make a little nick for a trigger finger, you have two or three stitches afterwards, it's done under just numbing medicine, um, the surgery itself takes about 10 to 15 minutes to do. Um, and it's, you're not taking anything out, you're literally just opening that little tunnel. Carpal tunnel release. Um, so caveat, this is a huge incision and the incision that we make, that I make anyway, but this is the cartoon picture I can find, is like literally this much. So, and same thing, it's just basically opening this ligament. So that one has four or five stitches and takes about roughly um, about 15 minutes to do, 15 to 20 minutes to do, and it's outpatient surgery. It's done under numbing medicine with a little bit of twilight. If you've ever had a colonoscopy where you're kind of a little bit out of it, we do it like that. Um, blood loss is like a half a teaspoon and people get pretty good relief out of it. Outpatient surgery. Um, and those are some of the most common things. Obviously there's a ton of hand conditions and I can you know, talk about this all day and we can still keep going. So, any questions? This, this um, basal thumb yeah. arthritis that so many of us seem to have, what can you do about that? You said that... Uh, yeah, so, there's, so similar to a hip or a knee replacement surgery, where we take out the arthritic part of the bone, and, they repl and like for a hip or knee replacement, you like replace it with metal and plastic parts. For the thumb, we actually take out those bone spurs there, so you take out that little bone that's arthritic, and then you take a tendon that comes from right here, like a slip of a tendon, and you basically weave it around and you keep, keep that space open. So it's an outpatient surgery. It's done under a general anesthesia. Um, it is, uh, there's a little temporary pin to help hold it in place and you have to wear a cast for about a month. And then there's usually about another two months of therapy afterwards. So. What about, uh one like this. Well, then you need to make an appointment. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. I have a question about carpal tunnel. Yeah. I was, I was kind of told that it wasn't, it could be in the shoulder or the uh, elbow because like my pain is like. 
Yeah. Yeah. Is that the arm? So remember that picture with all the different colored nerves and stuff like that? So there's different tunnels. So there's a carpal tunnel, there's cubital tunnel, there's your radial tunnel, there's the space that your nerve comes out of, like your spine, like the bone that comes down out of there from the spine. And so that's why the nerve test is important because it helps to designate, do you have a pinched nerve? Where is your nerve pinched? Is it pinched in more than one spot? Do you have more than one nerve pinched? Um, and how severe is it? And that's all the information we get from it. And then based on that, then you differentiate and figure out a plan. Um, and a lot of times people can have a pinched nerve at the neck and down here in the arm. And so obviously a neck surgery is a bigger surgery than a carpal tunnel surgery the way I described it. And so surprisingly, people can sometimes get some adequate relief when you do the carpal tunnel portion. <laughs> That, that gives them enough relief on the neck that they can kind of, you know, sit on the neck or do some rehab or stuff like that. So carpal tunnel pain is just in the hand then? Carpal tunnel pain, can, it can radiate. It can radiate up. Yeah, because just like the nerve talks from your spine and goes down your hand, down to your fingertips, when you touch things, right, like you're sending signals back up to your spine too. So when you have a pinch in two different spots, those two pinch spots like kind of talk to each other and kind of make a bunch of noise. It's like having, you know, it's like when you've got, I'll say this because I'm also a woman, it's when you've got two women that are like talking to each other and it's like you fight, you kind of feed off of each other, right? I do the same thing with my girlfriends. It, it, the two parts of the nerve talk to each other and then you end up getting more and more irritation and then sometimes if you can just shut down one side, the other side kind of quiets down a little bit too. Okay. And is it worse or... Are they, do they go together, numbness and pain? I mean, or do you want everybody's to see a, Everybody's different. Okay. Everybody's different. Okay. That's why it's, there's not a cook, there's, you know, it's, it's like, you know how things are. It's like, you know, you get the recipe from about, like, whatever cookies they are from the person who makes them that you really like and you make it and it doesn't quite turn out the same, right? There's a little bit of a touch of figuring out where things are and there's a little bit of a finesse and nuance to it. Can you resolve the Issue through EMG, is that how it's no, it's diagnostic, oh, it but it's, it does not solve the problem. Okay. Yeah. And the only non-surgical treatment is the splint type of thing, basically. So um, it is for symptom relief, meaning it makes you feel better, but carpal tunnel is generally progressive. So once you got it, it just keeps building. Okay. Same thing for the thumb, it just keeps building? Yes, because like we talked about, um, there's not any ways to regenerate the cartilage. Right. So my question was kind of on that, that note with the numbness and the pain, because most of everything you said seemed to be pain related to tendonitis or carpal tunnel. I've never experienced that, I've just experienced the numbing and uh, tingling sensation. Yeah. And it's only intermittent. Yep. I can't tell you that it's uh, any activity. Yeah, and that's why everybody's a little bit different. And some people don't feel absolutely anything. And then they show up and they say, just two, like just three weeks ago, it started burning all of a sudden. I've never felt anything before. But when you get the nerve test, it's severe. And severe doesn't start in three weeks. Severe starts, you know, long time. So some people don't even feel anything until it gets to be like pretty much, you know, like the you know, end stage. Like you know, yeah, so everybody's different. So it's, it's, but it will progress is what you're saying. You'll eventually feel some pain? Um, everybody's different. Some people never feel pain. Some people only feel the numbness. Some people feel pain all of a sudden. They never felt the numbness. Some people feel nothing and they get atrophy in their hands. So in summary, um, we went over a lot of common hand conditions. We talked about arthritis, tendonitis, carpal tunnel syndrome. We talked about an office visit. If you come in to see me, what do you expect to kind of get from that visit? different tests that we might do for your hand, treatment options for your hand, non-surgical and surgical management, um, and kind of gave you a little bit of an overview of what to expect. Well, thank you guys for coming out. I appreciate it.